welcome you all to my presentation. Um, the topic is Bluetooth, and uh, to be exact, it's uh, reverse engineering of a Bluetooth controller. Um, yeah, what I did for my master thesis is I uh, took this phone, this is a Nexus 5, and I looked at the Bluetooth controller inside this phone, which is uh, Broadcom BCM4339, and um, I took the firmware and reverse engineered parts of it, and also at some point I was able to modify the firmware and do experiments with it. And so in the end, um, I came up with a little framework to do those modifications and experiments with the uh, chip and with the lower layers of the Bluetooth protocol. So this is what I'm going to present today, um, basically the outcome of my master thesis. So the agenda, um, I will start with a quick introduction on what motivated me to choose this topic. I will also try to briefly introduce to the Bluetooth architecture and the, the protocol stack of Bluetooth. Then we will jump into the reverse engineering part. This was actually the biggest part of my thesis. Um, I took lots of time to reverse engineer the firmware and I'm only going to show some little pieces of it. So uh, for one thing, uh, how did I extract the firmware? And also, how did I find out about uh, why, or how can I patch the firmware and modify it and do experiments on it? Then I will uh, show you the framework itself. It's called Internal Blue. And I will show you how it works and its features. So the most prominent feature is the um, LMP monitor and injection mode. So LMP, I'm going to explain that in a second, is a protocol that is called a Link Manager Protocol. It's a very, or re relatively low layer protocol of the Bluetooth stack um, that's only handled inside the firmware of the controller. And it's used, for example, for connection setup, pairing, encryption, and so on. So it's a very interesting protocol, but usually you can't really access it. So I build a patch to monitor and inject packets of LMP. And I'm also going to demo that. So we will see a pairing sequence of the secure simple pairing mechanism in Wireshark, hopefully. <laughs> and then there's a second demo where I took a vulnerability that was released um, this year, and I wrote a little proof of concept with the framework so that we can see that the vulnerability actually works. It's actually affecting the secure simple pairing protocol. Okay. So just a quick slide about me. I'm still a student at the university here in Darmstadt, um, but I did my master thesis now, so I'm not going to be a student any much longer. Then I'm also a pen tester at ERNW in Heidelberg. Uh, we also have a conference there, the Troopers Conference. And I'm also a CTF player at the uh, CTF team here in Darmstadt, the Wizards of DOS. And we also have a CTF running right now, so for everyone who does not know about that, Go check it out, it's awesome, and we need more players. <laughs> okay, so what motivates me to choose this topic? Basically, this is my whole motivation. I stole this slide from Michael Osman and Dominic Spill. They are both, um, or they both gave a lot of talks about Bluetooth because they are the creators of the Ubertooth platform. Maybe you heard of that. The Ubertooth is a little hardware device that helps you to sniff Bluetooth. And when they present it, they always say how difficult it is to actually sniff Bluetooth on the physical layer, because other than Wi-Fi, um, it does a lot different. So if you take Wi-Fi, for example, a Wi-Fi device always stays on one channel. And if you want to sniff the Wi-Fi device, you just tune in on the same frequency, and you can put your Wi-Fi card in monitor mode and sniff the packets of this card. Uh, for Bluetooth, it's different. Two devices are always hopping between frequencies very fast and in a pseudo-random fashion. So if you want to actually sniff a complete connection, you have to hop along. And yeah, to inject, it's even difficult, more difficult. Um, so sniffing Bluetooth on the physical layer and injecting Bluetooth on the physical layer is not as easy as with Wi-Fi. That's the one part of the problem I was facing. Then if we have a look at the Bluetooth architecture, so this is a very simple drawing of the, the Bluetooth protocol stack. You can see that it's basically split it in half. So the upper parts of the Bluetooth protocol are handled inside the host. That would be your Linux system or an Android system, uh, Windows, whatever. Um, and the lower layers are implemented inside the Bluetooth controller. And the Bluetooth controller is a dedicated hardware chip that sits on the main board of your smartphone or that comes in form of a little USB dongle 
And yeah, they both communicate with each other over the host controller interface, the HCI. And yeah, now the thing is that if you want to experiment with parts of this Bluetooth stack, then it's rather easy for the upper layers because you can just go into the Linux source code, for example, and uh, look up the implementation of the l 2 cap protocol, for example, and mess around with it. But if it comes to the lower layer protocols, then you would have to dive into the firmware of the Bluetooth controller. And this is a proprietary device. It's not open source, and it's a lot more difficult. But there's still a lot, a lot of interesting things down there. For example, if you see here on the right, the link manager, um, this one, this is an entity inside the controller, a logical entity that is managing everything that's related to connection setup and maintenance. So if uh, one device wants to connect to another device, the link manager would um, start a pairing procedure, connect to the device, do the authentication and so on, and also the encryption. So um, this is a pretty, pretty important component inside the controller, and it uses this link manager protocol that I mentioned at the beginning. So the LMP protocol um, is basically terminated on this layer, and the link manager speaks the link manager protocol to the other devices to basically manage all the connections. But the problem is now, if I'm on my Linux host and I want to uh, see what's going on, I can use Wireshark and I can tell Wireshark, hey, look at my um, Bluetooth controller and tell me everything that's going on. But I will only see the host controller interface packets as the lowest layer, because the link manager protocol is completely handled inside the controller and never ever reaches the uh, upper parts of the HCI protocol. So, yeah, this was also part of the motivation why I wanted to look inside the controller firmware and I wanted to do experiments on this link manager protocol. Now, if we start to look at a chip, the chip is called BCM4339. And this is a small diagram. You probably can't read anything, but it's not meant to be so. So there are two parts inside this chip. The right part is actually handling Wi-Fi because this is a Bluetooth Wi-Fi combo chip something that's uh, very common in smartphones because Wi-Fi and Bluetooth both share the same 2.4 gigahertz uh, band. And I will only look at the left side of this diagram, which is handling the Bluetooth part. If you're interested in the Wi-Fi part, then go check out the Nextmon project because there's already a lot of uh, interesting research for the Wi-Fi part of this chip. So uh, you probably can't read it, but up here, if you see the mouse, um, is the controller. This is an ARM Cortex-M3. And uh, above it is uh, some RAM and some ROM. And inside the ROM is probably the firmware. So this was basically my first target to get the firmware. And uh, I started by looking at the so-called HCD files. Um, some of you that have Broadcom Bluetooth controllers maybe already saw them. Uh, here's an example. Um, it's basically a firmware update file that comes with every um, Broadcom Bluetooth chip because they wanted to do patches uh, even after they ship the chips. So usually you have inside some firmware directory a HCD file that contains uh, firmware patches and updates. And I took a look at this and uh, tried to understand how the procedure works and finally come up with uh, what happens to be vendor-specific HCI commands from Broadcom. So those are HCI commands that are sent from the uh, host to the controller and that are not specified inside the Bluetooth specification, but that are only valid for Broadcom chips. And as you can see here, there's a, a, a command that's called write RAM that is used to actually write the firmware patches and changes inside the address space of the chip. And below is also a command that's called read RAM, and I use this to dump the firmware off the chip. So this worked quite well. And yeah, then I got the firmware. I could throw it into a disassembler and start reverse engineering. The most interesting thing to reverse engineer after I took a look at the overall system, so basically this runs a proprietary real-time OS, and I first had to reverse engineer quite a lot of things to finally understand how this works. But then the most interesting thing uh, was the patch RAM mechanism which is the actual mechanism the chip uses to do temporary patches to ROM. Because actually you can't write the ROM. The patches that you are doing 
to update the firmware are only temporary. And this is what they refer to as the patchram mechanism. It basically supports 128 four byte long patches and it works with uh, three tables inside the address space of the chip. There's a table that contains the target address of your patch. So this is the address inside the ROM you want to change. Then there's another table that contains the new value and a third table that's just a bitmap telling if the slot is enabled or not. And yeah, once I found out how this actually works, um, I was actually able to modify arbitrary parts inside the ROM, temporarily of course, but this is cool because now I can change everything in the, in the firmware that I understand what it does. <laughs> and yeah, this then led to the framework as I told at the beginning. So um, the framework is called Internal Blue. It's also open source. You can download it and try it out yourself. The screenshot you can see here is the command line interface. So I basically, during my reverse engineering, I wanted to have a convenience command line interface where I can just do some um, live hex dump of the memory of the chip or search through the memory of the chip or patch some things to try something out. So I built a command line interface but you can also use the framework just as a Python module inside your script. And basically it works like this. This is the setup you have. Um, I have a Nexus 5 smartphone connected via USB to my host. So the Nexus 5 is the Android device here on the right. Um, it runs a custom Android Bluetooth stack. So I had to recompile the Android Bluetooth stack with debugging features enabled. This is not the case with the stock ROM. So you have to replace your Android Bluetooth stack with a debugging Android Bluetooth stack. And if you do that, then it opens up two TCP ports that you can see here. Um, those TCP ports then offer a way to interact with the HCI protocol um, live. So during Bluetooth is actually working on the phone, you can still, through those TCP ports, inject HCI packets to the chip or also read every HCI packet that is transferred um, on the UART interface between the Android Bluetooth stack and the Bluetooth controller. And I then just used the ADB tool, like the Android debug bridge, to forward those ports to the host computer. And from there, my Python framework can connect to them and therefore interact with the chip inside the phone while the phone is actually running. And you can use Bluetooth on the phone while the framework is running. And inside the framework, um, the logical structure looks like this. You have two threads running that manage those uh, transmitting and receiving of HCI packets. You have a core framework layer, which basically implements uh, some sort of an API to interact with the firmware. So you have convenient functions like read some memory, write some memory, patch some memory, or also some more advanced stuff like activate the LMP monitoring patch or something like this. So, um, I try to extend all the features in the core framework um, and you can then use those features either inside the CLI or you can just write a Python script yourself and import it as, as a Python module. Yeah, basically it's not very uh, difficult. I have only five files. Uh, it's a core.py file that contains those threads and also the, the API. Um, everything that's related to HCI parsing is uh, inside the hci.py file. Um, I also have a file called fw.py. So this is meant to hold everything that is specific to this one firmware in this very device. Um, so every uh, address offsets or little patches that I wrote that only work inside the um, Bluetooth controller of this device. I put inside this firmware.py file and you can just swap it out if you want to use it with another Broadcom chip. And then, yeah, of course, you have the CLI and all the commands that are implemented in the CLI. Okay, um, now I'm going to explain the, the LMP monitoring mode feature because I think it's the most interesting one and also because I want to demo it. So, yeah, you should know how it works. Basically, I reverse engineered the firmware and looked for all the functions that handle the LMP um, protocol inside the firmware. And I came up with two interesting functions. The first one is called the LMP dispatcher, or I called it like this, because it's called every time an LMP packet arrives at the device, and it then dispatches the packet to another function depending on the type of the packet. But I'm just inserting a hook there to copy the packet 
into an HCI event packet that can be sent over the HCI uh, layer up to the host, and the host then listens for these packets and extracts the LMP packets, uh, encapsulates it into a PCAP stream, and then pipes it into Wireshark. And for Wireshark, I still need a custom dissector plugin uh, for this LMP protocol, but that luckily already exists because uh, Dominic Spill and Michael Osman wrote it for the Ubertooth project. So I could took this and it just works. We will see it just in a second. Of course, I also have to patch and hook the second function, which is the LMP send packet function. That is the function that is called every time the device wants to send an LMP packet to a remote device. So if I hook both of them, I have both directions of the data flow. Okay, and I think this is already time for first demo. So, um, I have connected a Nexus 5 to my um, computer, and I'm going to activate Bluetooth and start the, the framework. So this is now the, the CLI. Can you actually read it? Is it too small? Okay, cool. Um, so this is the CLI. You can have different commands here. For example, I can do a hex dump and see, um, ah, this is a little bit ugly. That's better. Um, so you can do the live hex dump of the memory of the chip while it's running. You can search through the memory, I can patch memory, and I can also start and activate this uh, monitoring mode patch. So this will then start a Wireshark instance, and I'm actually now only interested in the Wireshark instance. It will, in the background, patch the firmware to uh, forward all the LMP packets to my host system, and the framework will then forward it to Wireshark. And if I now start a pairing procedure, so if I pair it to my other device here, we should see some packets. Okay, now they're, I think, paired. Yeah, now it's done. So this basically is how LMP looks like. That was quite a lot. Let's have a closer look. So for example, this packet was a name request that was done from one device to another uh, to basically just ask for a name, and the other device then responds with a name. Um, you can see it, I named the other device Nexus 5 AAAA. So this is something that happens on the LMP protocol layer. There are feature exchanges. And let me just scroll down to find the beginning of the pairing procedure. So this is here. Um, this is the first phase of the secure simple pairing mechanism. This is the current um, and secure pairing mechanism for Bluetooth. So what you probably use when you use Bluetooth. Um, it has multiple phases. In the first phase, it does this I.O. capability request and response. So basically, both devices exchange information about can they display a pin to the user, or can the user type in a pin on the device so that both devices know uh, what the other device is capable of. And after that comes the key exchange. This is a Diffie-Hellman key exchange, and here is basically the public components of the Diffie-Hellman key exchange happens here, and because it's too large for a single LMP packet, it's split it up in such encapsulated packets, so you can see here that one device wants to send 48 bytes to the other device, and then come free payload, um, free payload packets, and actually this is uh, the, the public component of one device, and we should see here that there's another um, in a different direction, so this is the public component of the Diffie-Hellman key exchange in another direction. Um, the Diffie-Hellman key exchange alone would be insecure because Diffie-Hellman is vulnerable to a man-in-the-middle attack. So what Bluetooth actually does is authenticate Diffie-Hellman. Um, so in the next phase, they, um, they exchange two random numbers. Um, you can see them here, that the, the nonce values. And then they use this nonce values and every information they exchanged above here and um, calculate a hash from it both devices independently, and then they took the last six digits from this hash, um, the decimal digits, and show it to the user. So this is the pin you actually see when you want to pair your devices. And 
yeah, the user then have to decide, is, are those two six-digit numbers the same? And if yes, then probably there was no uh, man-in-the-middle attacker and modified any of those values. And then um, the next phase is just checking if the Diffie-Hellman key was calculated correctly, and then there's an authentication phase where they do a challenge response. Like here, it sends a random number, and the other device has to calculate a response to this random number uh, using the shared link secret, and it's done in both directions, and then both devices are mutually authenticated. And that's basically it. That's the whole pairing procedure. So as you can see, it's quite convenient to look at it in Wireshark and to not look at it uh, inside the specification or something. Um, what I also can do is I can send LMP packets. So you maybe saw before that I found this uh, LMP send packet function that I also had to hook. I can also just call this function uh, from inside my framework and I, for example, can send an LMP packet of type one with payload hex zero zero. Um, this is a name request uh, at offset zero. This won't work because both devices are not connected <laughs> because um, yeah, they just paired they did not connect. I have to connect the devices. Okay, now they are connected. And now this uh, will automatically find out uh, if there's any active connection and send the LMP packet through this connection. And we should see in the Wireshark capture that there's a new name request here. And also the other device actually responded to my injected name request and sent its name again. And I could also like do something else like request the name at offset free, which is also possible. Uh, and then I will see that the other device actually responds with the name at offset free. And so you, you see that with this, you can actually do some interesting experiments uh, how the firmware of the other device is actually implemented and handles those requests. So, but I think that's enough for this demo. Let's continue. So, um, right after I handed in my thesis, uh, basically four days after I handed in my thesis, uh, this vulnerability was released. It's called the fixed coordinate invalid curve attack. Um, and it affects actually the secure simple pairing protocol and also the pairing protocol of uh, Bluetooth Low Energy because they're quite similar. Um, there's a paper that I read and it's really interesting. And after I read it, I thought, okay, um, I understand now how this works, let's implement this. But first, uh, let's explain how it works. So you saw that we have a Diffie-Hellman key exchange um, between those devices and it's actually Diffie-Hellman with elliptic curves. And the researchers that found the vulnerability um, found out that there's a problem with the Diffie-Hellman key exchange here, um, basically with the authentication of it. So uh, let's start at the beginning. If you have Diffie-Hellman key exchange with uh, elliptic curves, then the public components that are exchanged are actually points on an elliptic curve. So basically an X and a Y coordinate. And the uh, Y coordinate is actually not authenticated by the pin. So this is something specified in the Bluetooth specification that only the X coordinate should be authenticated and the Y coordinate does not affect the pin at all. So a man in the middle attacker can always change it however he wants. The thing is that normally a device can detect this because the X coordinate is still authenticated and the, cur the curve is actually known. So you can always calculate the Y coordinate from the X coordinate, right? But if the device does not do this and does not check if the point actually lies on the curve, then it's vulnerable to this attack because then the attacker can just set the Y coordinate to zero, for example, and he does that in both directions. So both devices actually have to be vulnerable. And if he does that in both directions and both devices do not check for this, the calculation of the Diffie-Hellman key actually uh, results in a null key, uh, which is still valid, both devices pair but they use a null key which can be obviously predicted by the attacker. And yeah, so this breaks the security obviously. It only works in 25% of all cases because the private keys have to be even. Don't ask me why, <laughs> I'm not a mathematician. So what I did is um, I wanted to implement this and 
as I said in the beginning, it's hard to do man the middling on the physical layer because of all this frequency hopping and so on. So um, I decided to just implement the attacker inside the firmware of my device, um, just to simulate the attack. I want to just add a patch that zeroes out the Y coordinate every time a public key is received and also every time a public key is sent. And this basically simulates the attacker as a man-in-the-middle attacker. And additionally, I also enforce on this device the private key to be always even so that I uh, higher my success rate a little bit. And of course, the Nexus 5 was actually vulnerable to this, so I didn't have to bypass any checks on this device in order to get it to work. So if I do this to this device and pair another device to my Nexus 5 that has this uh, attacker patch inside it, I can actually see if the other device is vulnerable, because if pairing works, then the other device did not check if the Y coordinate was zero. And we can try that out now. So let's stop this. Um, and yeah, so here can you can see the the patch that I wrote. This is now uh, if you want to actually use the framework uh, inside your own script files, you can just import it. Oh, that does not work. You can just import it as a Python module and write some firmware patches yourself and hook functions. I'm not going to explain that now. I'm just going to run it. So basically what it does, it patches uh, specific functions inside the firmware to zero out the Y coordinate every time a packet is received or sent. And that's basically it. Now this device acts like an attacker. Um, to actually see something, I'm going to start the CLI again. And I obviously have to unpair them again. <laughs> Can also do like this. You can actually see what's going on. I think that's more interesting now. Um, so you see, I unpaired it again. Um, I see the other device there, and I'm trying to pair to it now. And if that works, then uh, the other device is vulnerable. If it does not work, it might just have failed because the other device chose an odd private key. But let's try it. And it worked the first time. Uh, you can't see it because it does not update. Now it updates. Okay, you see here now that the devices are actually paired, even though this device acts like an attacker, and we can look at the Wireshark trace again, scroll up to the key exchange. So here was the key exchange, and basically when the public components are exchanged, it's first the X coordinate and then the Y coordinate. So what we see here is uh, in the packet, first is the first part of the X coordinate, then we have the rest of the X coordinate, then starts the Y coordinate, and this is the rest of the Y coordinate. And basically, the, the check of the Diffie Hellman key basically worked. They both authenticated to each other, and now, uh, yeah, they are paired, but I can predict the key. Uh, I, as an attacker, know the key that they have calculated. Um, so you can use this with any other device. I just used it with Nex another Nexus 5 because I know this is vulnerable. But you could also just now take this device, pair it to your own phone, and see if it works, then your phone is vulnerable to this. <laughs> and yeah, I don't think many devices are patched up until now. I checked it with my phone at work, and it still works. <laughs> okay, so to conclude this, um, I think there's still a lot more security research to be done on those lower layer of the Bluetooth protocol. Uh, we have seen Blueborn, for example. It only targets the protocols uh, um, at the upper layers, like above the HCI protocol. And now I think we also should focus on, on the firmwares of those devices and see if there are any vulnerabilities in there. And for this, we need some tools like this framework, I guess. Um, one big advantage of this framework is that I just reuse the Broadcom Bluetooth stack at this point. So this is a commercial Bluetooth stack that already works quite well. 
and I only change minor things. So I always have a working setup and I only change minor things to try something out. This is a very fast way to experiment or also to prototype things. And yeah, also now that I, I started to reverse engineer the firmware, I can also start to look inside the firmware and do static analysis on it and see if I maybe find some security issues there. Okay, I think that's it. If you have any questions, then feel free to ask. Uh, yeah, now I'll just bring it full. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question is the live patching in there in the firmware. Is that regularly used during normal operations? So to like control what the firmware does, or is that more like um, something you would use for security patching or for last minute patching of bugs? Um, I didn't understand the first part of the question. So which feature inside the firmware? Well, so apparently you can patch the firmware of the chip live, yeah, but only to a certain amount. So is that something that's regularly used, like to switch the chip from different modes or to make it do something specific, or is that something that is in there just for like getting a last minute bug fix in or getting a security fix in? So is that part of the normal operation or is that just for basically fixing things in the chip? Yeah. So um, I only looked at this one chip and for this one chip it looks like it's only for firmware patches, so fixing issues. Maybe it's also adding features, so maybe you could also do something like upgrade from Bluetooth 4.0 to Bluetooth uh, 4.1. If the physical layer does not change, you could basically do that if the space is enough to add enough patches. But I think it's probably mostly bug fixes. And it's not like that um, it does that during the normal operation. It just loads all the firmware patches at the beginning when the chip resets and starts and then that's done, and it never uh, does that during the normal operation. Thanks a lot. Any other questions? Yeah, if there are no more questions, feel free to check it out on GitHub. Um, so here's the link again. Um, in the GitHub repo is also pre-compiled Bluetooth stacks that have this debug feature enabled so that you have those TCP ports and can actually use the framework if you have a rooted device and can put the debug, uh, the debug image of the Bluetooth stack on, on your phone. And then it should basically work. It works for the Nexus 5 at this point. And we are also trying to port it to the Nexus 6P because it also has a Broadcom chip inside it. And there are a lot more devices actually that have Broadcom chips, for example, also uh, some Raspberry Pis, which would be quite interesting. And yeah, this is still work in progress. But feel free to check it out and leave your feedback. Okay, thank you. <laughs>